Welcome into episode 181 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian DeFelice, joined by Bridget Pru and Scott McLaughlin. And the Bruins had a pair of one-goal victories this weekend. First over the Pittsburgh Penguins, 4-3 to three in Pittsburgh, where you saw David Pasternak get goals 55, 6, and 7. Um, and then they followed it up on Sunday with a shootout victory over the St. Louis Blues, which it took four years. But I think the Bruins finally put an end to the Blues Cup hopes in a season, correct? Is that is that accurate, Scott? Yeah, St. Louis now officially eliminated from the playoffs. There we have it. So, like I said, a couple years late, but hey, better late, better late than never. And in doing so, the Bruins earned their 60th win of the season. Uh, it's already they've already eclipsed uh, a, a franchise record for wins in a season. They now sit just three wins shy of the NHL record, which you guys may or may not care about that listening. Bridget and Scott, you may or may not care about that podcasting but it's an objective uh, goal that 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 is in front of them that they could that could realistically reach in the last what six games or five games that they have here five five games left so yeah you get to win two to tie three to break it so you know uh, we were talking about this on sunday skate this morning and my feeling is like you might as well go for it you know it's it's a nice carrot to dangle on the stick and they're a team that's you know obviously the bigger motivation is get ready for the playoffs, you know, make sure you're on your game, good habits, all that. But in terms of like actually winning day to day, you know, what's your motivation to actually win games and and continue to get points. Like that's a pretty good one. That's a nice little feather to have in, in your cap. If, if, if you, if you can get it. So yeah, it's, it's not the primary goal. We know that none of these regular season records have, ever been the primary goal but you like you see a game like today right where bergeron's resting krejci's out now jim montgomery said krejci actually wouldn't have been able to play still doesn't sound like it's anything major though uh mcavoy rests so you see the bruins still taking that approach of okay bigger picture in mind let's make sure we're healthy let's you know manage guys workloads all that but then for the guys who are out there on the ice, go and win the game. And they do ultimately in a shootout, you know, they get up three, nothing and blow a three, nothing lead. And I really, I thought really that third period, you saw a team that was kind of feeling the schedule a little bit and, you know, playing second day of a back to back and missing three year stars. Like it seemed like it finally caught up to them. They kind of ran out of gas in that third period, but then they find, you know, they find enough to squeak it out in a shootout. They nearly win in overtime. Dmitry Orlov rips a one timer past Bennington, but Pasenak was offside by only about seven feet. So uh, that goal came back. That was a pretty easy overturn. But you know, you find a way to get the win. Like you said, number number sixty, only the fourth team ever to do it. And yeah, you, like you might as well try to chase down. Those 95 96 wings, the 18 19 Lightning, the Canadians point record, which is still in sight. Like, you know, why not? You're still trying to win games no matter who's in the lineup. Yeah. And the guys who come in know that, you know, they have that added pressure even more so to, to try to get things done. And, and, um, you know, they can make an impact on on history as well, even though some of the guys haven't played much of the season. Like if you're talking about Steen, who just came up um, and got his first goal of the season and somebody like Lauko and then obviously still to come, probably some other call ups um, towards the end of the year. Maybe, you know, the last two or so games of the year, we could be looking at some other guys jumping up into the lineup and they have, you know, they obviously have their professional careers and to play for and to, to try to impress people, but they also have this, um, you know, they can be a footnote in this record if they're able to help the Bruins get those last few wins. So I just want to comment real quick on just the national coverage because uh, Saturday was on ABC, obviously owned by Disney ESPN and uh, Sunday was on TNT, but on Saturday, did you guys did you guys hear like the comment after Pasternak's post game in uh, post game interview where I don't know I don't know who it was if it was Ray Ferraro or somebody but somebody commented on like yeah 
Pasternak, you know, had a great game and um, helping the Bruins get out of this sluggish streak they've been in. But it's like Pittsburgh was their ninth win in their last 10 games. And I, like, I don't know if you guys heard that or saw people talk about that. It online. was Emily, Emily Kaplan during the interview and it almost threw pasta off. Like she was like, do you feel like you're back? Like this, this team is back after like a hard time. And he's just like, yeah. <laughs> but but one, one, one of the gentlemen in the, in the, uh, in the um, studio commented right after, I, cause I heard her say that too. Now it, it, when she said that, I was like, I was like, what do you mean are the Bruins back? Like they have six, they have, they have 59 wins in the year at that point. Like when were they not? Um, and then narrative, somebody in the studio, Ryan, narrative. And, and then somebody in the studio like said, yeah, like literally comments on like Pash not getting the Bruins out of their sluggish streak. And it's like, they've literally just won their ninth out of 10 games. And we've talked about on this podcast because we talk three times a week. Like we know that throughout those nine wins, like they weren't playing their best hockey. So if maybe, maybe that's what they're referring to, but like, I don't, I find it hard to believe on a national broadcast that they'd be that into the weeds of like, how they played in those nine wins. They just like, I just like, they don't, I don't know. It's like, it's like weird. The narrative that goes around the Bruins sometimes the national I, coverage. I wonder if like, they're almost getting that from the Bruins. Like they're doing their production meetings and the Bruins, you know, whether it's Montgomery or the players that they're talking to or saying like, yeah, we haven't really been playing the way we know we're capable of, you know, we want a 60 minute effort, like same things that like we hear. And it's like, I think we know that like that's because their standards are so high and their expectations for themselves are so high that yeah, when they have a couple games where they're, it's only a 40 minute effort, like they're kind of disappointed in, this, in themselves, even if they got the win. So I, I feel like, I kind of feel like part of it is like those guys probably hear that and then they take it to the broadcast and it's like, well, you know, and it also kind of like can add to, I guess the story of the game of like, not only are the Penguins fighting for their playoff lives, but the Bruins are, you know, trying to get back to themselves or whatever. Like it gives them an angle for the Bruins as well. But yeah, it does. It, it does feel a little overblown when you just look at the wins and losses. And it's like, you know, Bruins have the best record in the NHL over the last 10 games, just like they have the best record all season. And it's like, you know, like, tell me who is every game in dominant fashion right now because it's not happening. Yeah, well, it, to to like speak to that as like being on the broadcasting side of it for college hockey, I, I have production meetings every weekend or every week before Fridays and Saturdays with each team's coach. And yeah, they will only tell you like bad things about their team. They'll only be like, yeah, we're going to be better at face offs and uh, penalty kill could improve, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of the times it's um it it's more just what they're worried about not necessarily what like the broadcaster should just take verbatim and be like oh yeah they're you know they're going through some stuff right now um anyway yeah i i i know what those meetings are like and the coaches are normally you know very high on their opponent and very much this is what we need to fix yeah i mean i i didn't mean to you know bash the 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 broadcast teams, I just, it's just sometimes when you hear things like that, it's just like, oh God. Like, well, it just know. reminds you that we're not like, that they're not following things the same way we are in the same way that the Nesson crew and. Well, but they know. should be, but they should be though. I mean, that's kind of what they're, I mean, I don't know. Like, I'm not saying not to criticize the Bruins, but like, it just seemed, it just seemed, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> it's just like, I, I mean, I'm the first one to kind of like, you know, talk about with the Bruins if they're not playing great, but sluggish sluggish you know streak that they're in okay so just one nine out of ten but okay go off um so to keep it to uh the games at hand we, we can break down you know different intricacies about each game but i think for me one of the more important storylines to follow and scott you wrote about it and we've commented on it in the past but it's just we've seen a little bit more of it like this the Bruins power play has been kind of getting off the schneid a little bit. And although McAvoy wasn't in the lineup today, nor was Krejci, you wrote about it, Scott. And I just feel like I, I, I like that, that look of, of um, that unit of McAvoy, Krejci, Bertuzzi, Zaka, and Pasternak. And it's, it's helped them get out of a, this, this slump that their power play has been in. And I just think that they should, they should go with what makes sense right now. Just continue to, maybe lean on that unit, maybe a little bit more than the other unit. Yeah. I would definitely like to see it get more run. Now, obviously they couldn't 
use that unit Sunday because both McAvoy and Krejci were sitting. But yeah, I mean, small sample size. They've only played 10 minutes together on the power play across four games, but they've scored three goals, uh, you know, until, until the Bruins second power play goal on Saturday, which was like right at the end. It was kind of a mishmash unit, like Greer and Nosek were already out there for the next five on five shift and passing our tips home uh, in Orlov shot. Before that, it was that, you know, I'm going to call them the check unit. Cause that's what Jim Montgomery has called them had scored the last three going back to last Sunday in Carolina, then Thursday against Columbus. And then the first power play goal of Saturday's game against Pittsburgh. And, you know, like you've been desperately searching for answers in the power play for weeks, months, like, and you haven't really found anything that's clicked and that's clicking right now. So yeah, I get like, it's tough to, you know, to have to tell Bergeron and Marshan they're on the second unit or whatever. Like I, Montgomery's, you know, good at delivering messages. He can figure out how to, how to talk to them about that and how to, you know, answer questions from the media when we ask them. But yeah, the overall takeaway though is like that unit is has looked better than anything they've had in the power play in a long time. So I would definitely ride them and give them a chance to basically to keep proving it and to keep to potentially run with the title of number one unit. Yeah, and, and we've already seen how Montgomery skirts it by saying Pasternak's unit is the top unit. You know, that's just how it is because he's Pasternak. So, um, and then that they, you know, kind of flop him back and forth and get him more time. Um, but yeah, so, so Brian, you didn't get a chance to talk about this, but Maria from Watertown called into Sunday Skate this morning and Scott and I and Razor talked about it a little bit, but she said, she, you know, I hate to be blasphemous, but... I thought that the power play looked better without Bergeron in the bumper. Um, what do you think about that, Bri? Well, I, 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 Scott kind of went over it a little bit last episode too, but I just think uh, I think Zaka just brings a skating element that Bergeron doesn't have in puck retrievals in the ozone on the power play. And I know you mentioned the bumper in particular, and there's not a ton of retrievals there, but there actually there actually is. Um, I also just like. I just really love that combination of Zaka in the bumper and Bertuzzi on the goal line slash in front of the net because Bert, Bertuzzi is one of those players who's really, really efficient at that quick one touch pass to the slot from the goal line. Like when it goes from like the circle or the, it would probably go from the, from the half wall to Bertuzzi. And then he just like, before the defenders can realize that the puck's already in the bumper. Whereas I just feel like Bergeron and DeBrusque don't really have, they don't really uh, exemplify that play too often. A lot of times, like they do here and there, but I don't know. There's like, there's like, there's a confidence to the way Bertuzzi does it. And you can just tell he did it a lot in Detroit. And now it's kind of a specialty. And like Zaka has a really, really good shot, really good snapshot, really good wrist shot. And um, yeah, for me, it's, for me, it's, it's, it's not, a, it's not, uh, it's not about Bergeron. It's just like, it's, it's just more about what Zaka's doing. Um, because Bergeron obviously is wonderful at it. He's really good. But there's just – I think there's a quickness factor right now with Zaka, and he's feeling really confident about his game. And he has a little bit more size, and I don't know. Um, for me, like, for me, it's – when I think of that first power play unit struggling, the first thing that comes to mind is not Bergeron. It's Marchand. Like, I, like Marchand to me is the one who's, like, just – He's just stagnant out there, and we covered it last episode, so I don't want to go over you know too too much. But he just doesn't. I, I I'm starting to wonder. Like, I'm really trying to figure out right now if what's best for Marshand is for them to rest him for the playoffs, or to let him keep playing. Because like I just feel like he doesn't seem very crisp out there right now. He's kind of he's not he's not Brad Marshand, and I don't know if rest will help that or 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 if he needs to work his way out of it. But at this stage in the season, like he should be like clicking on all cylinders and he just seems to be fighting it. Like he's like, he's not, he's, he's kind of just like giving the puck away a lot, which is not like him. Um, yeah. He had a really weird turnover that almost led to a girl, a goal in the first period um, that mm-hmm. I noticed. It was just very unlike him, the way he stick handled um, the puck right away from himself without all that much pressure. Um, yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, Brian. No, no, no. Um, it's okay. Yeah. 
I I have two things to that. So Bertu- to the Bertuzzi thing, he also is different in, in Debrus than Debrusque on the power play in that he is a bit more physical um, and probably more of a nuisance to push out of that net front spot. And um, so I, I like the way that Bertuzzi's played on the power play, he got the power play goal um, in today's game. So I, I like that look for him and having him there, I think is, is different than having DeBrus there. And I think he can be more effective there. Um, and to the Marshawn thing, this was his 13th game in a row without a goal. And Scott and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. Like you have to go back so far to find another time where he's gone that long without scoring. Yeah, I think, I definitely think part of it's mental, you know, like he's, he's gripping the stick a little too tight and now kind of, kind of forcing it a bit because I feel like it has gone into his head a little bit. So Brian, to your point, like, I, I think my, I feel like there's probably one more rest day for Marshan coming up. And, you know, I, I think next Sunday at Philadelphia is probably going to be a pretty big rest day for a lot of guys. Um, Cause that's, you know, back to back with travel kind of, one of those situations again, which we've seen them now use a couple weeks in a row to get a lot of guys rest. Um, but I also think like you need him to play out of it because I don't think it's just about rest with him. If, if it was, you know, if he was like really banged up and needed it, then he would have been staying home with Bergeron this weekend, but he didn't, he went on the trip and he played in both games. So I think he's healthy enough to be playing and you know, he's just going to have to battle through it. And and he's done it before, you know, it's not like he's never slumped. So this one has definitely dragged on longer than, you know, I think a lot of past slumps for him, but he's, he's going to have to play out of it. Um, Did you guys, what did you guys think of his breakaway? Like you see in the past, you see an overtime breakaway with nobody in front of Brad Marsh on. You're like, okay, he's got a good chance of scoring this. What did you think when you saw him go on that breakaway today? Um, I don't know. I I actually thought he had room under the pad and I I don't know if the puck kind of slid off the end of his stick a little, or he just didn't get the shot off that he, wanted but i i thought he actually had bennington opened up a little and he just kind of put it like almost right into his skate like towards the bottom of his legs so um yeah i don't know i I guess i didn't really think much of that um one thing i was gonna say like on the power plays you know we touched on this a couple episodes ago where it's interesting you know pasnak has talked about how penalty kills are really taking away the elbows on their power play more you know really playing like three wide less compact and i feel like pasenak we've seen at times has adapted to that with like that step inside that we've talked about and i I just feel like martian hasn't adapted as well like he hasn't found the way around guys being on top of him if he's at the right dot or a little outside the right dot um and you know i think he he tries to force plays too much and Lastly, my last power play thought on the like Bergeron versus Zaka thing, it's Bergeron's biggest strength in the bumper, I think, is getting shots off quickly. You know, like that quick release where he, you give him like a couple inches opening and he'll, he'll get the shot off. Zaka, I don't really know if Zaka can do that or not, honestly, but what Zaka's doing is he's just moving around a lot more. Like he's popping out higher. He's getting himself open. He's getting the puck in space, turning, pivoting, attacking downhill. You see him, you know, drive towards one post, dish across to the other side. You know, the assist to Bertuzzi a couple games ago like that. The diving assist to McAvoy against Pittsburgh. Like, those are plays you just don't see Bergeron making because he's just not as active. And for a long time, like, that was fine. He was great in the bumper. He's been one of the best bumper power play guys for for years but i think with teams now kind of figuring out that unit and figuring out what they want to do and defending better like it it requires something different and that check unit and specifically zaka in the middle like they're bringing something different and you know zaka just plays that role a little bit differently and right now i think the way he's playing it is more effective 
I think there's more there's more mobility, creativity, and confidence in that Zaka Bertuzzi unit that we're talking about in comparison to the power play unit that we've been watching for years here in Boston right now. And I just feel like that's the biggest thing. Like I don't I, I I'm not gonna say that that unit offers that much more size. Like, because I think, I mean, a little bit more size, but it's really the mobility, creativity, and confidence. And and they're just zipping it around. Um, and, and yeah, it's just, it's, look, it's, I, I didn't think that we'd be sitting here earlier in the year talking now, talking about, like, having the Bruins having a PP1 unit without Bergeron and Martian. I'd be like, all right, well, where did, uh, did Wayne Gretzky and, you know, Mark Messier come come to the team? Um, but 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 they've added – They've added and Zaka, you know, he's emerged all year. He was an unknown for us earlier in the year when talking about this team. Um, and 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 combine that with Marshan just hasn't seemed like himself, like offensively, production wise. And and he'd be the first one to tell you that. So we're talking about a situation where you enter the playoffs in April, like there's no time to massage things and figure things out. You gotta win. You gotta get off to a good start in, in the first series. You have to, you don't want to play from behind. You don't want to hear the pundits come out from the all the munchkins come out from the house in the in, in munchkin land in the Wizard of Oz and start saying, say, 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 tip all over again, 2018, 19. Like the Bruins want to get up to a good start in the playoffs, and special teams is a big, big component to that. And this new look unit has offered more to the table, in my opinion. So I don't know if you guys have any closing thoughts on that before we move on. Yes, no, no maybe the, so. the, the, uh, the only thing I would say. One one point that Razor has made consistently as a little bit of a counterpoint is the Bruins power play was really struggling going into the playoffs last year. And then against a great Carolina penalty kill was actually one of the strong suits in that series and actually had a pretty good series. So like that, that's also fair. You know, like these guys who have shown they can go from, you know, a little bit of a slump to turn it on when it matters. So also fair. But you know, and, my counterpoint to the counterpoint would be that the Bruins didn't have a second power play unit like this that, you know, could be an alternative. Yeah. And just to, to you know, finish up that thought, they have also added weapons. It's, it's not like they don't have the weapons they need to be successful in the power play. They have the weapons there. They just some of them are somewhat slumping or just not um, in the right rhythm on the power play. But you even add two power play weapons at the deadline with Orlov and Bertuzzi. So theoretically that personnel is set up for success. Um, you know, playoffs are, are kind of different people step up. And if you're the Bruins, you, you hope that you see a little bit of a shift in um, the urgency on the power play once playoff time comes around. One final thought for me too. And it just came to my mind cause I just completely forgot, but Felino and Hall, both guys that have been out of the lineup for over a month at this point, um, like they're two guys that Taylor Hall in particular never left a power play unit all year. Nick Felino, I feel like was on one of the units for most of the year too, as a net front guy. So we're talking about as it currently stands with those two guys out of the lineup. You you have you have ten guys that create two deep power play units. What is what what do they do with Taylor Hall when he comes back? Do they, do they try to slide him into like where do they put him? Like. That you don't want to mess up that that Bertuzzi Zaka, you know, we just talked about. Is there room for him on PP one? It would be either him or DeBrusque, right? Or maybe you go with the four. I don't know. What like, what what do you think they do with that? More more particular like, Taylor Hall. Nick Felino, we know they could probably like not have to rush him into the power play, obviously, but like Taylor Hall. I could see Hall. So here's what I would like to see. Like here's here's my plan A. Keep this check unit together. McAvoy, Pasanak Zaka, Krejci, Bertuzzi. On the other unit, have Hall replace, I guess it could be Orlov or Lindholm, but I'll say Orlov because he's the one who's been playing um, kind of more in the, like, the elbow spot than the point. So then you get a PP2 of Lindholm, Hall on the left, Bergeron bumper, Marchand right, DeBrusque net front. And see how, see how that goes. Maybe maybe Hall, you know, helps spark that unit. Like he's he's obviously a good playmaker. He can play with some speed. He could help that unit's entries. So uh, that that's what I that's what I would do. That'd be my plan. What an what an embarrassment of riches this team has. Right. 
this is this is insane. This is like a this is like a international roster or like an Olympic roster or an All Star roster. I mean, that's crazy. That that's that's insane. Um, Bridget, you do you, do you do you echo Scott's sentiment there? Oh yeah, yeah. No, that seems like the best way to go about it if you're trying to preserve that um, the the Czech unit. Okay. All right. Um, I agree with that as well. Uh, so on on Saturday, the Bruins faced a team that right now, based off points percentage, would be their round one opponent. We've talked about that in the past. Um, in the standings, Florida has leapfrogged Pittsburgh, but because the because the Penguins have a game in hand, um, you know they're still ahead in points percentage. But what did you guys make of that game against the Penguins? I mean, obviously the Bruins. They weren't at full strength, and you know, they're like they definitely came to play for that game because because of the reason I'm just I'm talking about right now that the possible possibility of them playing in the playoffs. But um, what watching that game to me, it didn't change any thoughts of what a Pittsburgh series to me would look like. I think the Bruins would have no problem scoring. Um, but did you see anything? Did you see any challenges that you didn't anticipate that maybe Pittsburgh? could present in a playoff series you weren't initially thinking of, or is it pretty much status quo what you thought going into that game and not, 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 nothing's changed? I think, I don't think much changed for me. I, you know, Bruins are playing without Bergeron. I thought they were still for the most part, the better five on five team uh, score a couple of power play goals, you know, right at the ends of power plays, but Hey, they still count. Um, yeah. I thought, I thought Pasta just obviously ripped the penguins hearts out. Um, so no, I, you know, I don't feel like I really learned anything new. Like, you know, Crosby, Malkin, Gensel, Latang are dangerous and Gensel and Russ did get away for a couple breakaways or semi breakaways. So I guess, you know, that's something to watch. Like the, those wings are going to try to take off and, you know, Crosby and or Malkin are going to, send them in and are obviously elite playmakers who can do that. So be aware of that. But other than that, like I don't like Pittsburgh's depth. I don't like their goaltending. I don't like most of their defense. So I don't think it would be a particularly tough series, but um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I start. Yeah, I don't think it changed all that much, but it does concern me somewhat that all of the games that they've played with Pittsburgh were one goal games. And besides the Winter Classic, you know, there was a lot of goals put up. If you remember back to that very first um, game against Pittsburgh, I think it was in November. Um, that was kind of a weird game and the Bruins gave up a lot of goals and didn't look good to start that game. They were able to come from behind in that game as well and win. Um, so like you like their resilience and how they've been able to fight back against Pittsburgh and in, in situations where they were down. Uh, but those have been close games. Um, it's not like they, you know, blew Pittsburgh out of the water. Um, and, you know, but that being said, I, do you think the Bruins have looked like the better team in a majority of the periods in the, the three games that they've played against Pittsburgh this year? So I, I would still not be oh, too concerned about it, but like thinking, thinking of that, we might just see things a little bit in a Bruins lens. Um, and maybe Pittsburgh people are thinking, Oh, these were close games, you know, one bounce goes a different way. And, and those are wins. And in the playoffs, that's all you need is, just that one bounce in overtime or, or whenever uh, to go your way and you, you have a chance to steal a game. Yeah. I mean, I, I just feel like the Bruins depth would overwhelm Pittsburgh in about four or five games. Uh, I mean, they're... don't get me wrong on paper, on paper, it's Bruins all day. Mm. Um, but that's not necessarily how the playoffs work. No, it's not. But like, but I mean, I just, no, it's not, it's not. But if I were a betting man, I was, I, I would say that I, I, the Bruins would handle them fairly easily i mean they've added they've, they've they've added so much more depth since you know the winter classic and even when they played them this weekend they weren't they weren't fully healthy i mean no burrows on no hall no felino no forber like you know whatever so um yeah, they, I, yeah. the penguins looked somewhat dejected after the win as well where you can kind of see in their faces like they knew that they were you know they're in the last spot the eighth spot and that they had a chance to get knocked out of it that day which they did and they're going to be battling until the last game of the season for that eighth um, spot with Florida and 
you could also see that like in my mind, I'm thinking like, yeah, well, even if you do make that eighth seed and you're the Penguins, you now you know what it's like to play the Bruins. Like you just lost to them. So you're thinking, okay, are we just like prolonging the inevitable? Like we get the eighth seed, we go into a series with Boston where it's going to be an uphill battle the whole way. Yeah. And you know, like they, they could try to find the silver lining of, Hey, we were right there, you know, lost it late. But again, penguins are playing for everything in that game. Like they're, they're playing for their season and the Bruins, as much as we're talking about, you know, they are looking for ways to get up for games and they want to keep good habits and all that. They're not playing with that same desperation. Like you, that's one of those things like you can't, really bring until you're actually there like we can say you know uh that we want to see them play with playoff intensity the last five games well guess what they're not going to like their their season isn't on the line yet they're not playing for the stanley cup just yet so just by human nature like there is always other levels multiple levels that you can find come playoff time or come a situation like pittsburgh where your your season is absolutely do or die down the stretch that just bring that just like brings more desperation out of you than any amount of prep or you know pregame speech or whatever you know someone trying to start something in a scrum can bring so like yeah sure the penguins can take their silver lining if they want but you're you're gonna they're gonna see a different bruins team in the playoffs than they saw saturday yeah. And this was kind of a do or die game for the Penguins and they died against the Bruins. Like if you think about the last two teams, the Bruins played Pittsburgh right on the bubble and St. Louis, if they lost today, which they did were officially out of the playoff picture. So those are two teams that were playing or at least should have been playing with as much desperation as, as anyone. So and the Bruins are able to take both of those games. Um, one final thought for me on the Pittsburgh game was just, and I mentioned it off the top was Pasternak not getting his 57th goal of the year and a hat trick, obviously um, insane, totally insane. Uh, he was able to crack hundred points for the first time in his career officially. Although we've talked about it in the past, he was on pace for that before COVID um, in 2020. But I mean, it feels like it was yesterday. He got his 50th goal against the hurricanes. He's already at 57. So like, you know, 56, uh, I'm sorry, 56. Yeah. He scores so many, I lose track. But <laughs> regardless, you know, 60 is clearly in his sights. Um, and it if if the Bruins would have a 60 goal score, you're talking you're talking the first time since Phil Esposito and in, in back in the back in the 70s. I mean, the 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 I'm fairly confident when I say the Bruins single season goal record will never be touched. Uh, I think Phil Esposito scored like 76 or 78 goals one year. But I mean, just just you guys is like, and I know it's not that we haven't talked about this before, but again, for him to hit sixty goals potentially this year, like just your thoughts on on that, like on on being able to watch a Boston Bruin in your lifetime, covering the team um, in your professional career, and like being able to cover cover this season and and this player um, right now. Yeah, it's when you see that now. The only person who has scored more goals in a season than him in a Bruins jersey is Phyllis Bezito. The only person who has scored more hat tricks in their career in a Bruins jersey than him is Phyllis Bezito. Uh, most points by a Bruin in almost 30 years since Adam Oates had 112 in 93-94. It, like, it really puts into perspective that you are watching one of the absolute best goal scorers the Bruins have ever had. And one of the best offensive players they've ever had. Like it's, that's just the level that he's at. And yeah, like he's, he's put up goals at a rate that Cam Neely didn't. He just topped Cam Neely's best season. Now, obviously Cam Neely had the 50 goals in 49 games that in terms of a per game pace will never be touched. So I get that, but yeah, it's it's remarkable. Like if you were making the like the Mount Rushmore of Bruins goal scorers, it would be Esposito, Neely, Pasternak's going to be on there, and probably Johnny Busick just because he has the franchise record, obviously, you know, spread out over a lot of years. But like 
that's it. Like that's the that's the class that he's in. Yeah, and and he's he's kind of I I know he's not like completely an under the radar guy, but I feel like you he quietly like goes about scoring all of these goals, and he's he's a likable guy, um, and he'll never get as much credit as he really deserves around the league because McDavid is always there to to take the you know, the hardware and, and whatnot. And, uh, so it's, it's tough when you're so good, but you still, there's this one guy that's kind of always just a little bit better. Um, no, he's having, he's obviously having such an impressive season. Uh, and I don't know about you guys, but I I feel like he's one of those guys that if your team's down in the playoffs, you're like, Oh, well we have pasta. Like he could just at will just put one in the back of the net. He's somebody that you can rely on and he's one of the most consistent players uh, that the team's ever had. Well, hopefully he can continue that in the, uh, in the postseason. I mean, to your point though, Bridget, about him being like quietly under the radar, like, I mean, you have Connor McDavid who has 62 goals this year. Um, it was an absolute circus media circus last year when, when uh, Austin Matthews broke 60 and, and here's David Pasternak, like, you know, quietly at 56 goals. And the only thing that the local media will talk about with him is, uh, you know, he plays too much or he turns the puck over here and there. It's like, okay, well, you got a, you got a kid that's about to score 60 goals at 26 years old, but yeah, go for it. Um, and that's that, and that's not that's not me, like, you know, not saying we won't criticize him, but like, it, it, I'm more so speaking on the lack of just the lack of um, headlines surrounding this. Like, is anybody gonna discuss? this week in Boston and, and maybe they will, but is anybody going to discuss besides the skate podcast, what we just talked about, which is the fact that he, he he's eclipsed Kim Neely and he's only behind Phil Esposito in the team's hundred year franchise history next season. Well, like and, it's insane. Yeah. And by the way, on Sunday picked up his 47th assist of the season. So for like one of the other dumbest narratives is this idea that like, Oh, but all he does is goal score goals. And it's like, Nope. He sets up his teammates for an awful lot of them as well. Like he's, he is a complete offensive player. Like, and we, we talked take, about take, how... Connor, take Connor McDavid out of it. He's a class. Okay, bye. Bye. After, after that, like he's as complete an offensive player as they're in the NHL. And he's not like, he's not bad defensively. Like he, he'll do the job. You know, he's, he's never going to win a Selkie. He's never going to be getting Selkie votes, but for the most part, like he takes care of business in his own end too. Um, you know, the turnovers. Yeah. We all think there's room to improve there for sure. Like that's no matter how often the puck's in your stick, like that's not a category you want to lead the NHL in, but the, the positives so far outweigh the negatives that it's like the, the attention that is paid to the negatives. And I get that that's, especially sports radio. Like that's how it works, right? Negativity draws going against the green, you know, gets people's attention, but it it is amazing that like so much focus is paid on that one negative in his game. And so many of the positives are largely ignored or like thrown out the window or, you know, or whatever. Like, it's just, that's ha- that has more to say about our business than it than it does to say like about actual fans that actually like you know the people that buy the Pasenak jerseys and and that watch it for um, in order to root these people on rather than pick pick them apart. Um, yeah, it's it's more on us. But to the to the point about the assists and um, you know being right up there with the points. Obviously, it's fewer, but he really values himself as a playmaker. And he's mentioned it before that he's thought of himself as a playmaker first before he was a goal scorer. So yeah, there's really not much to criticize about his game. If you're being real, like of, of all the players on the team, I feel like he's the last person that anybody should be criticizing. Yeah. It's uh. He's quite the player, so it, it, it could be quite infuriating to, uh, again... Can you imagine if in Edmonton they were just, like, constantly criticizing McDavid? I mean, I mean just, some people do. Like, some of their playoff failures in the past or, like, years they've missed the playoffs, that there have been the contrarians up there that have 
tried to pin it on McDavid and Dreisaitl and been like, they don't want it enough instead of, you know, like they they've don't been have through, support. they've been through three GMs who can't put together a goddamn roster. Like <laughs> it's so th- that does exist everywhere. Um, it's not, it's not just a Boston problem, but because obviously sports is so big here and sports talk radio is so big here. I think, you know, it, it does kind of get amplified more here than, than a lot of places. Yeah. I mean, again, like I'm, I, I, I get the nature of the business. People try to create headlines and they try to create controversy and piss people off so that they get emotionally invested. But I, I just feel like there's a way to do that, but do it genuinely. And I feel like you can criticize, you can fairly criticize a game or a player based on what you're watching, as opposed to just being like discounting how difficult it is, literally how, insane it is to be a 60 goal score in the national hockey league this day and age when the game is as fast and talented as it is as when the goalies are as good as they are it's literally insane to me but well, um, however yeah. brian that would require more research and paying attention yeah. to the team to have a have a nuanced version <laughs> of what's actually going on yeah well that's why stick to the skate podcast for your bruins coverage from wei and Scott's we- writing and bridget's writing and whatnot I feel like we always have a rant about this on the show. Not not often, not often, but once in a while I'll hear something and I'll just be like, like, what are you talking about? Like to sit, like to sit there and say like, like, why is like, why is David Pashlak on the ice as much as he is? I don't know. Cause he has 60 goddamn goals this year. (laughs) And and like, he has 40 more points than the second highest score on the team. So (laughs) what do you want? Like, what do you want? This is why Brian needs to call into more shows. Anywho, um, let's, yeah, let's no, he, he leads the team in both five on five points and power play points, but yeah, definitely cut his minutes and you know, play him 15 minutes a night. Well, and, and cut his minutes, cut his minutes for who Charlie Coyle, all due respect, Tomas Nosek. That's what I Thomas have. <laughs> yeah, okay, just I'm just trying, I'm just trying to figure out <laughs> who we're doing this for. Okay, Pavel Zaka, who nobody <laughs> knew who he was besides they started watching him two months ago. Okay, yeah, good, great. Um, I just, I just, I just think it's insane. I think, I mean, it's anywho. All right. So one guy that I love to bash and I'm really glad that the Bruins ended his season today or playoff hopes was Jordan Bennington. Um, were you surprised that Bennington and Marshand or Bennington and Hathaway or somebody didn't have a bit of a dust up at some point today? He's on a short leash after the suspension. I feel, especially in a game that decides your season. Want to put a pass. I, I thought, yeah. Cannon. I thought at three nothing there was there's a chance. And I think like it might have been two nothing or right after three nothing. Like Lauko actually like kind of grazed him skating past. And I was like, oh, this could be it. But no, he kinda kinda kept Maybe his cool they and attempted him a little bit more. A few more yeah. like grazing, like close. They could have got him. They they could have, but obviously um if you're doing what's best for the team, you're not getting involved in that kind of thing in a a game that could decide your season. I mean, in all likelihood, they weren't going to make the playoffs where their position was anyway. They were on the outside, but, you know, in a game that officially ends your hopes, you can't be doing stuff like that. So, obviously, we talked about off the top, the Bruins are missing significant players. You are missing Bergeron, Krejci up front, your one and two center. Uh, you've been without Taylor Hall. You've been without Nick Felino, And they also were without Derek Forber and – Charlie McAvoy today with that said um, thought they came out, they played pretty well. They got the one nothing lead on a goal by Jake DeBrusque. I want to say it was his 25th goal of the year, which I believe yeah. is his second career 25 goal season. So there might be a bonus there for him coming. Good for you, Jake, or maybe not, but uh, he kind of snagged it from Frederick who obviously was a hometown boy today. Got the start alongside Marshand. Um, and you know, so just in the post game, he said he would give it to Frederick if if that's what he wanted. He's like, just give it to him. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, Frederick, Frederick shot it. Well, Debrusk, you know, he 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 did a lot of the heavy lifting on the on the on the left wing there, uh, and then took the puck to the net, found his rebound. But then Frederick actually shot the rebound. It just went out Debrusk's uh, shaft of his stick. But and then it was followed up by a beautiful, beautiful no look pass. Uh, yes, I said pass. By David Pashnak. He he does uh dish out assists, like Scott mentioned. Um to Bertuzzi on the power play for the two-nothing lead. And then Oscar Steen, not Oscar Steen, what the hell's his name? 
That's the guy. That, yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he hasn't been playing much this year. He, uh, he got <laughs> his third career goal, and um, for some for some reason, because they were playing the Blues, I thought I said Oscar Sunquist, who used to play for the Blues, but now he's in like Minnesota, and I just had a brain cramp there. But yeah, Oscar. Also, also Alex Steen, a former St. Louis Blue. Yeah, yeah, a lot of Swedes <laughs> that that you know potentially could have I could have said so. That got the Bruins a three nothing lead, and obviously St. Louis tied it up um, three to three. Bruins thought they went in overtime offside. Scott mentioned that shootout. Bruins win on a coil goal, and then Allmark with a sick love save on Braden, um, to Braden Shen to finish the game. So, mm-hmm. you know, guys, I only I only do that quick recap just to throw it back to you guys. Is there anything in particular from this game that stood out to you? Well, uh, so I think the last couple games, Pavel Zaka playing center stands out. I think he's looked really good as as a center. Um, which he did earlier in the year as well. So again, just kind of adds to the idea that, you know, going forward for this season, you hope he doesn't have to play center, right? You hope Bergeron, Krejci, Coyle, Nosek all stay healthy through the playoffs and boom, there you go. Um, But he has shown that he's capable of playing there when called upon. I think he does, he does what centers have to do. Like he's back defensively. He's making responsible plays. He can play through the middle of the ice. Jim Montgomery has talked about this a couple of times, how impressed he's been with Zaka's playmaking up the middle. Um, and then we also get to see Trent Frederick play center in this game. And I thought for the most part did pretty well that that line he was with, um, he was with Steen and Lauko. you know, they were the least used line. So it's not like it was a huge sample size, but made some things happen. He had, you know, he, Speaking of like making plays up the middle, he led the transition that led to Steen's goal, made the pass over to Greer on the entry, and then Greer has the shot that leads to the rebound. Um, so you know, I also I thought this was like an important game for Trent Frederick. He gets the two assists, plays pretty well overall. Um, had gone seven games without a point before this, and for a guy who you know is kind of in that bubble conversation of who eventually comes out when everyone's healthy, like some good games down the stretch will go a long ways towards making his case to stay in the lineup. And if he can add, you know, that versatility of playing center in a pinch, like that helps as well. So that was a pretty good, pretty good game for Frederick. Obviously, you know, we're not yet at the point where Hall and Felino are back and he's in danger of coming out of the lineup, but you want him playing well, for that reason, but also just in general, because until those guys are back, you're going to need Trent Frederick to be a contributor. And, you know, oddly, like he gets going playing center on a kind of a makeshift line um, when he had been slumping a little bit playing wing on the third line with coil. Which I think speaks to his confidence level now, like his maturity that he's showed throughout his career and, and where he's been able to bring himself Um because I can remember back a few times last season where it seemed like his confidence was lacking and in post-game press conferences, there were questions to him about certain things in that nature. But I feel that he's matured. Even in the way he answers questions after the game, I feel like he's um, kind of a different guy this year. And he, like you said, being able to do that in a role that, you know, center he hasn't played – all that much this year and, and go in between Steen and Lauko and them still uh, be able to score. Uh, and Montgomery was kind of trolling him a little bit in the mic'd up portion of uh, the game where they thought Frederick had scored the power play goal. So he said, look at that Freddie one for one on the power play. Cause he never plays on the power play <laughs> and they thought that he had that goal. So he was just trolling them. Um, and then also Montgomery made a dad joke and said, ready Freddie. And then he goes, I'm a poet. I was a poet and I didn't even know it. And Hathaway gives him the dirtiest look, like the way I would give my parents a look if they said something embarrassing in public. <laughs> it was, he was having fun. He was having fun uh, on the bench there. But uh, yeah, anyway, um, I feel like, oh, so the one thing I would want to talk about just quickly, we don't really need to go into it. Uh, Brennan Carlo, um, he spent a lot of time on the penalty kill today and really showed how important he is to the back end. I think Felino called him 
and Forbert when they're together on the penalty kill, the Twin Towers. Obviously not necessarily the best reference, but um, that's what he called them back there on the penalty kill. I, I just think that Carlo made a few mistakes, uh, you know, five on five, but on the penalty kill, he's so valuable. Yeah, one of the um, one of the more notable points in the game for me, even though the game ended up getting tied uh, late with the extra attacker on for St. Louis, but that five on three, the Bruins killed off a very extended five on three in the third period, and um, you know, a lot of the time I was kind of saying, questioning why St. Louis wasn't really attacking the net more and, and putting more pucks towards the net. They're more on the perimeter, but if you if you watch it, the Bruins just they are very, very effective at at ch- pressing the puck carrier without over committing to them. They're very they, they they utilize their sticks very well in their in their gap control. So like they'll go out, they'll challenge the puck carrier, but they won't over commit to them and then open up something else. And I just thought they were very um, positionally sound, and um, it was it was good to see that in that moment for them to kill off that five on three because the, if if St. Louis scores there. Maybe they just ride momentum to a regulation win against the Bruins. So I thought that was a strong penalty kill for Boston. Yeah, that was huge. And, and he was out there the whole five on three, I think. He was, yeah. So Brandon Carla, the Bruins had spent 626 shorthanded total in this game. Brandon Carla was on the ice for 536 of that. Only 50 seconds of all their penalty kills today was he not on the ice. Like that was a monster performance from him on the penalty penalty kill, especially. And by the way, guys, Bruins penalty kill is now killed off 28 straight penalties. So we've talked about, you know, how will it look without Derek Forbert? Will they miss him? Will it struggle right now? Not struggling, going very strong. And Carlo's obviously a huge part of that. Yeah. And then when Forbert comes back, the workload is, you know, he can take a little bit of the burden off of Carlo's shoulders, or he could go put them both out there. Um, you know, so it, it, and once again, we're talking about depth that they have that's waiting on the bench to come back when, you know, four birds healthy. Well, and that, that's something that comes to mind too, for me is like when I, every year going into the playoffs, I sit there and say to myself, just please don't let this guy get hurt because then they're screwed. And like, because of the depth that they have and the high end depth that they have, the only guy I think that about at this point, I mean, if we're talking winning a oh, cup, Mark. if we're talking, okay, but no, not even him because like Swayman's been like, he's been up there in every cat statistical category too. So it's like, even in goal, the Bruins had like yeah. their backup goalie is more, I'm more comfortable with him than I am against the fields goaltenders, except for maybe Vasilevsky, obviously, and a couple other, you know, big guys, but, um, like, obviously, if Bergeron were to go down or McAvoy or Marshan, like, yeah, like, I would be very, very disheartened about their chance to win a cup. But I feel like the Bruins could withstand an injury to just about everybody on this team, except for Pasternak, if they want to get at least to, like, the third round. Because if Bergeron did go down for a couple of, for, for a couple of weeks, like, we've seen, like, they, like, as much as they're so much better with him, like, and it would be a big challenge. Or if Marshan went down for a couple of weeks, like they have guys that can go in there. You can't replace a 60 goal score if Pasternak ends up getting 60. You can't replace that, um, and you can't replace all that Bergeron brings and all that stuff. So I'm not saying that, but if uh, my point is this team can withstand the war of attrition because of the depth that they have, both in the bottom of the lineup and the top of the lineup, and the versatility amongst all their fo- all their forwards and defensemen. Like you're talking about, like again, don't forget, like they have like. They have two number one defensemen on their team and a third guy who's like a, a one B defenseman in this league. So like even up, even on the back end, they're just, it's pretty crazy. So, no, you, yeah. you're a hundred percent right because Bergeron and Krejci didn't play against Pittsburgh and Zaka and Frederick did just as far, like they did a fine job. Uh, they're not those guys, but they can still handle it. It's not like you're like, okay, we're calling up someone from Providence that, that we've not really seen too much or anything, anything like that. And, and remember back to the beginning of the season where they won a majority of the games when both McAvoy and Marshawn and Grizzlick 
were out of the lineup. Um, and that's at a point of the season where guys are coming in a little bit rusty and you kind of never know what's going to happen. Um, and, and things are a little bit up for grabs in those early portions of the season as teams and players try to figure things out. So that's a time where they were missing McAvoy uh, and Marshawn and Grizzly at the same time. And they did fine. Didn't they win like nine of the 10 games? I don't know. They won a bunch of those games to start the season. And um, and now you see them missing Taylor Hall, Nick Felino, and Derek Forbert, as well as Bergeron and Krejci and McAvoy for rest and still winning. It's kind of insane that you don't really notice the drop off when you're missing your best defenseman in your top two centers. Yeah, and I, and I would say, and Scott, I'll throw it to you to to uh, finish your thought. I, I mean, I would, yes, Bridge, like I totally get what you're saying. And 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 for those listening, like don't mistake what we're saying as in like, like we're not saying like they can last without like those guys. Like obviously for one game against St. Louis, yes, what Bridge said is true. Like we're not, we're not saying over the course of a series, but just in general, this team has the versatility and depth to, you know, really step up for, for anybody who goes down. Again, except for Pashnak, there's not like, that would be a tough, tough blow considering how much of the offense he's provided for you this year, despite their depth. But um, Scott, just any closing thoughts for you? Uh, so my one closing thought is actually so something we were talking about earlier. Um, Matt Porter, who's out in uh, St. Louis covering the game, tweeted out a couple quotes from Marchand after, and he basically said that he doesn't he doesn't want to rest and he doesn't expect to rest down the stretch he he wants to play he wants to sharpen his game so just kind of tying into what we were talking about like martian obviously knows there's still stuff to play through and, and get right in his game before the playoffs and it seems like you know at least according to him he feels healthy enough to keep playing and to try to figure it out on the ice rather than rest and you know i would also add like these after sunday's game they're now off till thursday in terms of games, they're off completely on Monday, no practice. I think there's a chance they might also be off on Tuesday. They haven't announced their schedule yet. So um, this will help everyone obviously kind of get this little little break and then hit the last five games. And then they're going to have another little break before the playoffs start. The last game is on a Thursday, and then game one of the playoffs won't be until at least Monday. So they're going to get, you know, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday off then as well. So there will still be some rest built in, even for guys who aren't held out of games. Well, one last thing for me is uh, I really hope the NHL rids of the shootout next year or in short years to come, because despite the fact that the Bruins were on the winning end of things, I just, I'm really over the shootout. They introduced the shootout back in 2005, 2006, after that 04, 05 lockout. I think they brought it to, you know, add a new element for fans. And I mean, we're talking almost 20 years of that now. And it's just, I mean, if you watch anything that Evgeny Kuznetsov has done in Washington, literally taking 12 seconds to, to, to go on a shootout. Like I just hate, I just hate a competitive game like today in general, like finishing a shootouts. Um, hopefully the NHL can fix that going forward. I know it's not a big popular topic is the shootout anymore. People don't really like it that much. I don't know if you guys are, are fed up with it too. Well, Brian, you don't have to worry about it in a, about a week and a half. <laughs> We're going to be going a 20 minute overtime. So that's true. I'll have to worry about pulling all nighters when the Bruins inevitably yeah. play a six overtime game or something like that. But it's, Scott's going to need more coffee and popcorn. Yep. They can provide that for him there. <laughs> I don't um, know. They close down some of the stuff. And then when I walk over, I'm like, no. <laughs> and Scott's devastated. It's true. He's yeah. like, they gotta, cut him gotta, off. Gotta, you got to load up in regulation. The real reason why they stop serving is because because uh, Scott gets out of hand, and they're like, "We got to cut this guy off." It's, mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's like how like they they stop beer sales like in the seventh inning at baseball games sometimes. Yeah. Like, yeah, they got to you got to cut off my popcorn like at second intermission. Yeah. Have you seen? Have they been giving Scott like popcorn sobriety tests up there, like walking the line or trying to say the alphabet back? He tries to not get caught, so like he's he's avoided it so far. <laughs> Yeah, he's a, he's a subtle popcorn drunk. You can't really tell when he's when he's standing <laughs> off of it. Um, all right, the final the final grains of sand are uh, are dropping in our hourglass here. So, um, if you guys have anything else to discuss, now's the time. 
No, I think, not, we're good. No. I think we ran all the bases here. All right. All right. All right. So uh, the Bruins are back in action on um, Thursday. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Playing Toronto. And then if they beat Toronto Thursday, they have a chance to tie an NHL record Saturday night, um, which is 62 wins in a season uh, held by Tampa and the mid nineties Red Wings. So yeah, I will um, say that the two next games are going to be the hardest to win. The last three games are the easier games on the schedule if you don't consider resting. Because the last three games are um, Philadelphia, oh, what's the one in between, and then Montreal. Um, Washington's between those two. Yeah. So those are going to be the three easier of the five. Yeah. I mean, I, th I, th I, think, I think the Bruins will – I think they will break the record. Yeah. Um, and I think that obviously there's a bigger prize at hand, but when all is said and done, um, if the Bruins, if the Bruins win 63 games this year in the regular season, I mean, that's a record that could be, that could upstand for, you know, decades to come, which is really, which is really neat uh, when you, when you look back at things in retrospect, but in the moment, there's obviously a bigger prize uh, and, and an obstacle ahead for this team, but we'll be covering it every step of the way. So um, on behalf of, Bridget and Scott and myself. Thank you all for listening. We will talk to you very soon.